So if we are talking about electric motors converting electricity into hydrogen back into electricity again and all the problems involved, why don't we just have electric cars? Well, there's a couple of periods of electric car history. There's a hundred year old electric cars and those are interesting from a historical perspective. Electric cars have been around arguably longer than petrol or diesel cars. The most famous friendship, that of me and Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, shows this link with its cars. Thomas Edison owned a Detroit electric car, as did Henry Ford's wife until 1929. Edison saw a bright future for electric cars in the early 1900s, having a range of 130 kilometres. The electric car was seen as more convenient for city commuting due to their instant start and no need for hand cranking. Edison worked hard to produce a lighter and more powerful battery for electric cars, first introducing potassium hydroxide batteries. The batteries were praised on release by Edison as the battery of the future, but unfortunately, there were faults. The batteries started to leak in real-world applications and not hold their charge. Edison was forced to shut down his lead-acid replacement battery and completely redesigned a more reliable and more expensive battery. By the time the new battery was released in 1910, the fate of the electric car was sealed. Edison's friend Henry Ford had already started production of an inexpensive, reliable petrol car that had a fuel economy of 18.7 litres per 100 kilometres, or 13 to 21 miles per the gallon. The oil industry fueling infrastructure that the kerosene lamp had implemented in recession by the invention of Edison's light bulb was now looking for a fuel saviour, the Model T. So if the Model T, the blueprint for the use of the internal combustion engine in mass-produced vehicles, one of electrics, has the technology changed? Is there a new generation of battery to give people the range and speed they want? The next big period of electric cars was during the 1990s. Uh, we had the zero emissions mandate here in California that, that obliged the larger car companies to all make electric cars available to, uh, uh, to the public. And they were, for the most part, um, electric drives put into existing gasoline-powered cars and were, um, again, not particularly nice cars. The EV1 was maybe an exception to that. It was a, um, a purpose-built electric car that was better than any uh, production electric car that had ever been built before. Um, even so, it had its limitations. Uh, so uh, when I look back at all of those electric cars, at least since the 1970s, uh, they all had the feeling to me of cars that were made um, by people who thought of driving as a necessary evil. You, you should walk, you should take the bus, you should take your bicycle, and if you must drive, then you know a, a utilitarian vehicle is all you need. And, and maybe that's, in an ideal world, the right answer, but we live in this world, not some ideal world. And we, uh, we have to make cars that people want to buy or they won't succeed. The EV1, with its nickel metal hydride batteries, had a range of 120 to 240 kilometres, at 75 to 150 miles. The new Chevy Volt will have a battery range of 64 kilometres on lithium-ion batteries, with Japanese car makers looking at an electric-only car with a range of 80 kilometres on a single charge. Australian electric car company Blade Electric can get a range of 120 kilometres on lithium-ion phosphate batteries. Lithium-ion phosphate batteries are the lower-powered, more stable cousin of the ultralight, ultra-powerful but unstable lithium polymer battery. The technology that would really blow the roof off electric vehicles would be ultra-capacitors. They could be built cheaply enough and hold enough charge, possible with carbon nanotube technologies. Electric cars would be able to travel distances of 300 kilometres plus, with no battery chemistry limitations, and the ability to be charged from empty to full in minutes through a service station style charging is very attractive. Unfortunately, you wouldn't be able to charge your electric car at home in minutes, as it'd probably melt down your power grid on your local street. CSIRO has created an ultra battery that is 70% cheaper than current hybrid batteries, combining together ultra capacitors with lead acid batteries, giving 50% more power and lasts four times longer than conventional systems. Unfortunately, these technologies, while out there, are still a long way off. The trade-off between the failings of battery power and the advantage of petrol is to merge the two technologies together. This has been seen mainly in two Japanese car makes. Either model does not have a factory option for an electric plug-in, as it is seen to be inconvenient to the customer. But due to the popularity of plug-in kits for these models, and GM announcing a plug-in series hybrid electric in 2011, others will follow. Well, battery technology needs to get a little better, 
in order for plug-ins to make widespread sense. I mean, the thing people have to realize about driving a car on electricity is that the cost per mile of driving on electricity is maybe one-third to one-quarter that of driving on gasoline. So there is a payback as long as the first cost isn't too high. I think everyone believes that the next generation of lithium-ion batteries are going to be usable in cars. And in fact, Toyota has publicly announced in the next generation Prius that they're going to run a lithium-ion battery onto the system. So I do think that we are now seeing and will shortly see the batteries of the future that are needed to make the plug-in hybrid work. Hybrids have been around for a while and are on the increase in popularity with most major car companies. But the increased price tag is a deterrent for many drivers and markets. The car companies have not pushed technology, or many of them, certainly the American companies, have not pushed technology as hard as they could have. Why? Because there really wasn't any money in it until relatively recently, and in, in, in maybe not even now. Um, Toyota has pushed it partly because it's consistent with their corporate image and corporate mission, partly because they have the money. They can afford to take the loss on hybrid vehicles because they've got all the money in the world. General Motors is a junk-rated credit. They can't afford to just throw money at, at technology that the customer isn't willing to pay for. Have the consumers behaved completely rationally? Probably not, but on the other hand, if you are a family of four or five, or you tow a boat, or you go on long trips, um, and, and this is, after all, a very big country. And you have the means to buy and, and finance the operation of a large, comfortable, not very fuel-efficient vehicle. It's a free country. Why shouldn't you do it? There's no signal um, other than kind of the, the uh, you know, what you might call sort of you know, moral suasion coming from people like Al Gore. There's no real signal to people that they shouldn't do that. If you look anywhere in the world, not just the United States, you look anywhere in the world, people will buy the most horsepower they can afford. I mean, you know, there's something kind of primal and elemental about having a powerful machine at your beck and call and at your command. Um, the car companies know this, they're selling emotion. If, look, if we just needed a, 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 an appliance to get from A to B, we'd all be driving around in, in Toyota Corollas. Uh, used ones, by the way, not new, because used is ever so much more economical. And that's not what we do. Why? Because we can. Um, and because this is how the industry makes money. And you know what? It's everybody. It's not just General Motors. It's not just Ford. They all do this. Toyota, they all sell power. They all sell prestige. They all sell um, size. They all sell high tech. Um, the question, it, I think, over time, if, if, if there's going to be a serious discussion about the impact of this on the global environment, is whether the car companies can shift from selling horsepower as a, as a proxy for technology and technological um, superiority and start selling um, high fuel economy or super clean emissions. Starting to, we're starting to see that. You're, um, it, I think Honda and Toyota, again, I think have led because it's kind of consistent with their corporate image. GM is trying to do that. I think a lot of what they say about trying to develop a plug-in hybrid is aimed at kind of repositioning themselves in people's minds. I think you'll see all the car companies do this. The question is whether sort of the big center of the American market is going to change without um, a somewhat more radical input like a big gas tax or much st stricter government regulation that essentially drives the market toward a more fuel efficient um, set of solutions.